Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Colombia International Arbitration Association uh, event, Breaking into International Arbitration. Uh, my name is Simon Bianchi. I'm one of the co-chair of the Columbia Arbitration Day, and I'll moderate today's debate together with uh, my great colleague, Andrea Chong, who is uh, Columbia International Arbitration's LLM president. Uh, we are very pleased to have uh, three esteemed speakers with us today. Uh, first, Ang Sentence, uh, who is a partner at White and & Case and heads the America Dispute section. Uh, I think she served as, as counsel or arbitrator under more or less all, all rules and, and that, you can, that you can think of. And we're very, uh, very happy to, to have her with us today. Uh, we also have the pleasure to welcome Herb Carlson, who is uh, currently managing directors of Three Crowns, uh, and, and in which capacity is responsible for the firm's global operation. And, and he, has, he has represented clients across a range of industries and, and once again under most major arbitral rules. Uh, and in addition to his private practice, Herb also teaches international arbitration at Harvard Law School. Uh, and, and he's one of the co-founder and co-director of the International Arbitration Workshop there. And finally, uh, last but not least, uh, our very own Kabir Dugal, uh, Senior International Arbitration Advisor at Arnold & Porter. And as, as most of you probably know, also a professor at Columbia University. Um, and and I'm, I'm not going to list all the, the accolades he received over the last years, but, but there are a few. And, and we're very happy to have, to have our three speakers with us and to have all, everyone, all of you with us today uh, to discuss. And without, without further ado, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave the floor to Andrea uh, to start with, with a few questions uh, of, about how to, how to best break into international arbitration in 2022. Thank you for the introduction, Simon. So I guess today for the event, we've kind of structured it into three key things we want to talk about. First, how students can network with individuals. Second, how they can ace the interview process. And third, beyond the interview, more general questions that we've received from junior practitioners. So onto the first question of networking, and this is just to all three speakers. Do you have any general advice on how to approach someone? And what are the huge do's and don'ts that you'd say we should or should not do? Anyone want to jump in first? Kabir, I see you nodding. So maybe you can kick this off. I, I was just nodding because I liked the question. <laughs> I didn't intend to go first. Uh, this is a great event. I know this is a stressful time. Uh, you have two really fantastic people here. Uh, Hugh, I think, is somebody Columbia knows. Ank is probably Columbia's most famous alum in arbitration. So you're really in very good hands. Let me just kick it off by saying four things. Uh, we are still in a hybrid reality, and that doesn't show any signs of changing anytime soon. So be flexible. With that in mind, when you are emailing a person to meet them, try to do four things. Be considerate. You're asking somebody a favor. It can get really obnoxious when you get emails that sound more like orders. Just read your email, think about it. That's my first point. Uh, the second point I would make is be thoughtful. Read the person's profile. I have received emails where I know this is a generic body being sent to everybody. There's no correlation to anything about Kabir and what Kabir does. Right? So just be a little thoughtful, tailor it to a person you are reaching out. I mean, you want somebody to give you time. Maybe you take the time to show that you're interested in that. Point number three, no typos. And more importantly, this is happening recurringly. No mistakes in names. 
people have called me dear miss tugal which i clearly don't see a problem in that but you haven't even made the attempt i've had totally different names put to me all together so you haven't even bothered to copy check just you know you've just got copy pasted something uh and the final point is find common points that always makes things more interesting right if you're reaching out to ank for example from colombia that's an awesome point you know she is a jd llm she's somebody who has succeeded in this field that's an awesome connection point right find commonalities find areas that are that are interesting talking points uh, and use that as the basis to start the process i'll stop here because i want to hear these awesome other two speakers but just some points for us to get started uh this panel uh i think i'm no longer muted so hi everyone thanks for joining this panel um as you heard i uh, i am a columbia graduate myself uh i tried to find a job as an llm and uh, did not succeed at it actually uh, originally um and then went back to the jd but i did succeed uh, during my jd and i didn't fully finish my jd so i just want to say that for two reasons i guess i don't want uh, it to be said in the world that i actually have the jd degree i don't uh but secondly also to to let you know i've been there uh and uh, i know uh, this is a challenging task uh, kudos to you for wanting to undertake it and and to start by coming to panels like this uh, it didn't exist when i uh, was in colombia and i think you'll learn a lot of valuable things that i uh, certainly could have done with uh, myself when i was when i was applying um i echo a lot of what uh, kabir said actually a lot of it resonated with me um i think when you're at an in person event so the networking is in person um try to say something interesting um but also not overly interesting or complicated and i actually think a lot of our job is about judgment and a lot of what i'll be saying today is about judgment so you want to try to come up with a nice unique little angle uh, on the other hand you don't want to start bragging about yourself for 10 minutes uh you, you you that's usually not a good approach don't oversell don't undersell try to be confident about the qualities that you do have but don't make it sound like you've basically run a case when most likely you haven't at your stage of a, of a career um I, i don't appreciate that i do like it when people again are are genuine about where they are enthusiastic about what they want to learn uh, of course we we all and we'll look we'll talk more about what we're looking um what qualities we're looking for but it is a mix of course of you know smartness um team play being able to communicate well with people and and being you know somebody that people like to be around uh, that's an important thing on the other hand this is a serious job we're not here to have fun all the time so again to to try to to have that balance between these skills i think is is the most important thing uh in an in person networking setting in a cold uh, email setting it, it's it's basically what kabir said try to find a point of connection try to show that you did your your diligence um i actually get emails where the email is in one font and my name is just in a different font um that's an email that i'm basically going to set aside right away um if you can't uh, be smart enough about getting one font in an email I, it's not worth my time it it just isn't um also uh, as kabir said we are busy people i think we all want to do well uh by other people but we also do have to get on with our with our day job and so sometimes when i get emails i will always respond always and i will always uh, try to give the people an opportunity the person an opportunity to communicate with someone it may not be me straight away i very often look at the profile that i receive and then will uh ask somebody else in my team to have a chat with this person um and then please just do that and do that enthusiastically um sometimes i get a pushback no i really want to speak to you 
that's not the right approach uh, in this type of, of setting. And of course, then make the most of the opportunity of the person you are talking to. They are in my team. They're a team member and I value their uh, views uh, in tremendously. Um, so those talks are important. And I think those were the main points that I wanted to make for this one. Well, um, let me begin by saying how, how pleased I am to be here. It genuinely is an honor. Um, echoing the kudos of others to our, our attendees, uh, it, it is um, going to be for many of you uh, a unique time and perhaps at times a stressful time. Um, there, there are a lot of LLMs that are expressing interest in the international arbitration market this year. Uh, and it's, it's important, I think, to familiarize yourselves with what you can do to stand out and, and to be more competitive in that. And, and that's what we're hoping to achieve today. One of the perks of speaking third with so distinguished a trio, or at least a duo, uh, is, is that I can just say that I agree with everything that's been said, and, and I can certainly say that here. Um, I don't have very much at all to add to that. Um, so permit me, if I may, to sort of make a few passing points, and then and then we can move on to the next good question. I When, when it comes to the in-person environment, Ankh said something very helpful, which is to keep it interesting. And, and I think that one way that you can do that is to make your own luck. Uh, you will perhaps have a sense of some of the participants that are going to be at a given conference based on the program, um, and there may be other information available as well. So to the extent that you can kind of read up about those with whom you would like to have a chance to talk with, um, you might open the conversation by making a comment about a point that they raised in a paper or in a recent panel, something like that that will allow you to have a natural in-way and, and allow you to demonstrate your interest in uh, not only what they're doing, but offer something insightful to say. Um, I, I think is a more memorable and, and helpful way to build a rapport with someone as opposed to, to just kind of striking up a conversation uh, without that, that additional scaffolding, maybe talking about the weather, which is just not gonna distinguish yourself uh, more generally. And in a similar vein, uh, appreciating that there aren't gonna be as many conferences, uh, at least at, at the current time, um, when it comes to emails, uh, many of those in the arbitration community with whom you would like to be speaking are going to be uh, from time to time, not only speaking on panels, but there could be recordings of panels in which they presented um, and, and sort of other occasions in which they've been uh, available in interview and the like. And, and Kabir is sort of at the forefront of some of that. And so that could be a great way to see some of these individuals in action, um, expressing views on some points that you could use in, in sort of reaching out to them. And so that's that's another way of finding something interesting to say, right? It's, it's a hook uh, that, that you can use to, to latch onto as a part apart from kind of just introducing yourself more generally. The only point that I would make that I think is a little bit different, Ankh mentioned that she's she's good about responding, and I believe it. Uh, I am not always good about responding. Uh, and so please don't hesitate where, where there's been radio silence to send a polite nudge. Um, it's, it's not going to be misinterpreted. Um, sometimes these emails um, will sort of uh, you know, for whatever reason, maybe they land late on a Friday or what have you, um, they, they won't be seen and, and that shouldn't be interpreted by you as sort of an implicit rejection. Uh, to the contrary, um, you know, don't don't hesitate to, to follow up a week or so later, say just in case um, a friendly nudge and, and that, that could be very well received. Thank you. Yeah, I think those are all very um, basic and fundamental things that everyone should be taking note of. But I think you, you mentioned something about um, being interesting and kind of having that hook to have someone respond to you. So I was wondering if any of the panelists had something to share about one of, uh, say, an interesting story of how someone reached out to you that was particularly persuasive and kind of got you thinking, yes, I would like to sit down and have a chat with this person. Maybe Kabir, you want to? Sure, I, the next question will go in the other order, but let me start this off. You know, it's easier to tell stories where people screwed up and there are a lot more of those. Uh, but I think you've, you've just gotten a preview. You know, you're all smart people. Trust your instincts. You know, I think what tends to happen is you get anxious and apprehensive, totally understandable, and then you do rush decisions and just take a pause. That's a big, big, big point for you all to consider. Things that have appealed to me is when people 
sent a thoughtful email just echoing something Hugh said. Good sense would say don't send emails on Mondays or Fridays. Just putting that out there for whatever it's worth. You know, those are generally bad days in the work week, although COVID, what's a work week? We, we can put that as a meta question. But sometimes we have had people who have reached out with a writing idea, looking at what I have done. That catches my interest more readily, more apparently. Somebody has taken effort to, to do something, to outline something, to come out with something, you know, value added. Those things catch attention more readily. Uh, tone matters just generally in life. You know, people who are more thoughtful, more erudite in anything that they're doing, that will catch your attention more readily. But I think that's something I'd urge you to do. Think about how or where you can add value. So I stop here and pass it to the two other awesome panelists. Okay, I, I, I was going. I was asking you if he wanted to go next, but I've been unmuted. So let me, <laughs> let me go. Um, so two uh, particular instances came to mind for me, uh, but they go. I'll go to the same point. So um, I have on my web CV uh, a note that I represented uh, Gary Kasparov in a number of uh, of matters. And uh, I once got um, uh, an email from a French uh, applicant who was a very strong stress chess player himself and who sent me a very enthusiastic email about that experience. And then he also had the more general uh, qualities that I was looking for. And he actually ended up being a, an associate at Whiting Case. But that... That email where he basically said, you know, I've, I, I, it's the first time I ever see anybody does an arbitration in the chess world. Uh, if I could help you even this year, if you're still working on these matters, I'd be so, so, you know, thrilled to be working on them with you. And I actually, uh, we then hired him and then I had to go to um, Norway. Uh, it's a long story, but for the World Chess, the, ele the presidential election of the World Chess Federation that summer before he started working, and I actually invited him to come with me. And we spent two weeks together in Tromso uh, on the Arctic Circle in Norway, even before he started his job. So, so that was a, a memorable story. One other more recent one that I thought was a good one is uh, I had an applic applicant uh, telling me about a very specific uh, BD opportunity in the country that he's from. And that also caught my attention. I thought that was a, a very nice way to go about it. Um, that Ang's last point is a terrific one. Uh, I think that sometimes um, and it, it doesn't need to be a personal connection to a business development opportunity. Those will be rare. Um, but even if sort of in the pages of Global Arbitration Review or elsewhere, uh, there, there are matters um, in which you may be especially well suited by dint of language, cultural affinity, um, interest or otherwise, um, that, that can be something that you can either introduce in an initial email or in subsequent conversation. Um, we, we've seen that deployed to impressive effect uh, on our side. And I would, I would echo Ankh there. I think speaking personally, um, I it, it's always nice when uh, candidates, and it doesn't need to be in the initial email, but uh, if if there is uh, a non-obvious linkage that can come up that introduces a more personal touch, and and this is by no means uh, at all a precondition to success in this, but if it's there, there's no reason to deny yourself it either. So, for example, from time to time. Um, you know, I'll, I'll be interviewing someone and it'll become clear that they're from Southern California. And I tend to consider myself a reasonably rational person, although some of our um, folks here may disagree. And, and when there's that California connection, um, I immediately become kind of irrational. And I'm just like, oh, that's amazing. Where are you from? You know, um, what kind of Mexican food do you like? So on. And so uh, it derails the interview unhelpfully, uh, but it, it does mean that there's some type of, of um, personal relationship. And uh, I, I don't think that that's a bad thing. And so if, if there's a way to, to kind of seize upon that, it can be with interests, hobbies, and so on, um, then then you, I think, will do yourself well by by exploring it. But again, I think that that can be secondary to to some of the the more important aspects of this, uh, which which we're going to talk about shortly. 
thanks very much for these very useful tips and and war stories uh, maybe maybe switching now a bit the focus to interviewing from networking to interviewing and and starting with the maybe the most obvious question but the one everyone is asking him or herself what are the qualities you look out for in inter for in an interviews and and maybe especially for llm candidates how do they how, how can they distinguish themselves or, or what are the, the specific and, and maybe starting in the reverse order. So maybe you, you can go first. So the lots, lots of different, um, answers here. I, I think that one, one way to distinguish yourself, um, or to think about this rather as sort of avoiding the negatives while embracing the positives. And so one thing that Kabir has touched upon uh, is avoiding typos. And so you're you're gonna wanna make sure at the outset that you've completely scrubbed your, your CV, you've had sort of friends and peers review it. Um, it's one of the easiest ways uh, I think to to kind of stand out in, in a suboptimal light. Um, and I, you know there, there will be subtle differences in language that may not be immediately obvious to, to some candidates. And so it, it is useful to have others um, kind of take a close look at that. Uh, and so too uh, with, with um, career resources and the like. Uh, when it comes to affirmative ways, uh, positive ways to stand out, uh, I, I think it's, it's useful to have reflected closely on the parts of your CV, and this is directed a little bit more towards LLMs, but certainly not at the, the exclusion of JDs, uh, towards parts of your CV that feature legal work um, in which you've done something and to think in advance of the interview about how you can speak intelligently and, and in detail to that, because that's going to be one of the areas that the, the interviewer is likely to zero in on. And, and it can lead to a discussion in which they're not only asking for a summary of it, but they may start to assume almost a professorial or, or even adversarial role in this, where they're kind of asking you questions uh, and forcing you to, to kind of uh, support your position a little bit. You might be responding to a hypo. And uh, it's, it's only to kind of more fully test your analytical chops in this. and so. You, you may want to think about what are the types of questions in that vein that I would be likely to receive in relation to the, the legal work that I've provided. But at a minimum, just making sure if it's been some time that if, if those are bullets on your CV that you're prepared to, to speak uh, in a little bit more detail, having them in, in working memory as opposed to trying to recollect uh, then and there. And that, that may strike some of you as just being kind of an obvious and unhelpful point, but um, I've had a number of interviews over the years, and, and perhaps others have as well, uh, in which it does seem like um, they have to pause and, and kind of reconstruct uh, what it is that they did um, here. It's been so long since they brushed up their CV and they turned their mind back to that. Uh, and that's a missed opportunity. You, I, I think the interview is really going to want, above all, to, to understand what you'd be bringing to the table in terms of legal thinking, analytical thinking and reasoning. And this will be, I think, a great way for them to do that. And so that, that'll that be where you can shine. So I'll focus more on what qualities um, one looks for when hiring someone for um, a career in international arbitration. And to me, it comes down to one looks for the qualities that you need for this job. Um, and first of all, this is a tough job. We have, we face very difficult problems. Um, we rarely get any easy assignments. Most of the assignments, most of the things that we need to do are tough. They're complex problems. There's no easy answer. If there was one, the client probably wouldn't be looking for your advice. Very often there is no answer, really. I mean, you have to do, do the best you can. Um, and various different laws may apply. These are just very complex legal problems. Uh, I was talking about it the other day. My, I don't want to uh, expand too much, but my brother is a civil engineer, and, and they always say, oh, the smartest people have to be engineer. And I always go into debate with that because certainly in the line of work that we do, I think the smartest people need to be lawyers because we have a difficult analytical job. So the first thing that we look for is to for really smart and analytical people. 
that's the 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 first quality we're looking for. Secondly, we we work hard. Our clients are demanding. Um, we have to deliver very often on short notice. Um, so I'm looking for somebody who's willing to work hard, who has energy and grit, who I think will be able to, you know, work with me at 11 p.m., maybe 3 a.m., and and keep up the spirit and and keep up the good work. So that's another thing that I'm really looking for. Um, teamwork. All of our work is teamwork. So I'm looking for a team player, um, somebody who can work with other people and work together uh, and who believes that the sum of the parts is more than the parts. I very much believe in that. And I really look for people who do too. And lastly, I would say um, we spend a lot of time together. So I'm looking for somebody that I like and that I will want to work uh, with together. And again, that's not about cracking jokes. That is about being supportive of one another, being on the same line, um, and just working well together. So these are the general qualities, I would say, that I look for in a candidate. And then just specifically um, to language, uh, to, to, two points, one for LLMs and one for JDs. I think for LLMs, two points on language. Uh, first of all, of course, language ability can be very important. Um, if you're a Spanish speaker, Spanish is hugely important to us. Russian, Arabic, there's a few other languages that are that are that are key. But then also to show and demonstrate your ability to read and write in English. It's extremely important. And especially, I would say, the writing. Um, not being a native English speaker myself, I've contended with this. And I can tell you, you can write like a native English speaker. Um, and, and that's what we ultimately want and need. And so if you are a good uh, English, if you write well in English, for instance, and you're confident about that, show why, show how you've come to be a good writer in English, volunteer to do a written test uh, or a written something in English so that people can actually see for themselves that you are a good writer. Because with LLMs, that's often a point of doubt. Uh, and and you want to convince that you can do the job. You can come in and do a memo just like a like a JD. That's an important uh, uh, thing, I think. And then conversely, for the JDs or not necessarily the JDs, but the Americans, um, show that you have an international interest. Um, you know, why do you want to go into this job? Is there something in your background? And if there's not, why 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 are you interested in this international field? And why do you think you would be good at it? That's it from, from my end for this. You know, I'm not going to add too much to what the prior two speakers have said, because I think I couldn't say it better. Uh, Ank, my dad's a civil engineer. My sister's an electronic engineer. We have these fights constantly. So that resonated with me. Uh, let me just point out a few things for the interview. Congratulations. If you have made it to the interview stage, people have already looked at your resume. They've already done some amount of screaming. So take that moment to take a deep breath that you've already crossed one hurdle. Uh, the key point I am looking, the two things that I'm looking, one of them is very similar. Both of them flow from what Ang said. I want to make sure the person isn't going to murder me in the night. That's point one that I'm looking at. I'm just kidding. <laughs> that takes me to the second point. I'm trying to make sure the person we're going to have is somebody we can work with late in the night and we're enjoying the experience. This is hard work. This is going to involve late nights. And you want to be around people who recognize you know, we're in this together. We're going to do this together. So be interesting, be positive, keep the perspective point that we heard, you know, don't go to either extreme. Ah, that, that's the other end of the spectrum, which isn't helpful. Find the moderate balance. Look at your resume, think about interesting points and wherever you can highlight a business case, do that realistically. I'll stop here because I don't want to repeat what our prior two speakers said, but be interesting. You all have done awesome things. 
give yourself some time to think about what makes Andrea unique, what makes Simon unique, right? What what might those be? We can't tell you that. That's unique to you. You need to sit and think for a moment. Oh, this is something I can highlight. This is something I can realistically put forward. So give it some time just to reflect a little bit. I'll stop here. Thanks very much for the, the detailed answer that, that we got. And now maybe turning to a bit of a more specific question uh, for, for candidates with a, a greater interest in, in niche aspects of practice, uh, for example, public international law, uh, should they communicate that interest in the interview? And, and if so, we have another question that is also quite specific, but for, for people envisaging clerkships or fellowships, uh, how is that valued in international arbitration practice? And, and once again, how should they communicate, best communicate their intent to, to apply for a clerkship or, or fellowship? And maybe maybe starting with, with Ang. So on the niche aspects of the practice, I do think uh, it's helpful to communicate that um, because I think it's, first of all, my first, uh, it, you always need to be genuine. That's a very important um, tip. Be genuine. That's what people are looking for. And if you have a serious interest in a niche, you should communicate that because that's what makes you genuine and probably interesting. On the other hand, niche practices are exactly that. And unless you're interviewing with somebody who does only the niche that you are looking for, you should also be very careful to communicate that this is a specific interest that you have, but that you are interested in the field broadly and, and enthusiastic about everything in the field. Because typically the niche practices, and, and I think public international law is a great example, there's very few uh, law firms that do only public international law matters. There's a couple, but they're, they're far and few, few and far between. And most firms that you will interview with have a broader international arbitration practice that will have a variety uh, of matters. And we generally want our uh, arbitration practitioners to be well-rounded in the field as a whole. It's already a niche field, right? Uh, in a way, um, you're already niching yourselves down from disputes more generally. So to within international arbitration, niche it further down, I think you have to be careful. Uh, now, if the niche is a niche um, where you know uh, a lot of work is being done and it's a profitable uh, line of business, then by all means, you can play it up. But if it is a niche that's probably uh, not the moneymaker for the firm, and probably not where you will be able to spend 100% of your time. You have to be realistic. And again, not say, and I'll also do the other work, but to also be enthusiastic about the other work and recognize that a lot of the skills that we have are transferable. And with a lot of the other work that you do, you will learn a ton of things that you will also then be able to apply if you, if you practice in the niche um, practice. But, but that, I think, is the, what I would, uh, would advise um, about that. Um, I'll also, I, I, and, and maybe related to that, in the end, uh, we all love the legal aspects of our work. Um, but in the end, these cases are about bringing a monetary return for clients. So showing... Um, that you that you are interested in that aspect, that you are interested in damages, that you are interested in how a boiler works, if that is what you have to argue in a case, is, is very important too. Um, on clerkships, I haven't had actually a lot of um, applicants who want to do a clerkship after we join us. The majority of uh, applications that I get, people have done a clerkship before, um, I, I, I'm not sure. I think the reaction to, to that at our firm would depend a little bit on the individual interviewer. Um, I personally 
about a clerkship would want to think about, okay, and when in the career would that be and how would that affect the career path? Um, because I tend to, I mean, I came to White and Case and I worked hard for eight years and I became a partner and that was my trajectory. And so I tend to want when the when our associates come in to work with them and develop them um, year after year. So I, I personally would struggle a little bit with the interruption in the career and how are we going to work with that? So for me, indicating an interest in a clerkship would not, it, it wouldn't be a plus for me. Um, I would have to like work work around that with the applicant, how we would make that work. So, and I think I'd rather have them do it before, uh, probably. And so maybe have a conversation about, we do like you a lot, let's keep in touch um, and then speak when you come back. Again, the, 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 the clerkships within the career, it, it, it's more difficult for me to, to get my head around. Happy or uh I'm happy to, to pick up from there. A um, uh, little to add on, on the niche point, I think Ankh uh, covered all the bases there. Um, the the only point I suppose that I would underscore is, is Ankh's about not wanting to signal um, sort of a passionless willingness to do work that isn't within your niche. I think we sometimes see that, especially more with PIL than than other spaces where candidates will come come in saying, here's what they're passionate about and sort of with a shrug acknowledge uh, that, you know, realistically, they would have to take on other work. I think that the most competitive candidates will be authentic to themselves and, and sort of express an interest in certain aspects. And that can include public international law. It can include, um, you know, uh, sector specific work or, and what have you. Um, but they, they will also sort of be very um, forthcoming about their interest, or at least uh, their enthusiasm about about taking on other practices and learning and growing, and, and often that that is attached to an acknowledgement that they're they're still sort of coming into the space, and that before long they may come to appreciate that their interests ultimately lie elsewhere, um, which I think is, has been true of many of us in the practice. We sort of start off in one place, and in our career and our interests take us in another. On on the clerkship side, um, I think this varies not only from individual to individual, but from firm to firm. Uh, and um, it's just as a general observation, there are any number of successful practitioners in international arbitration that have come from uh, federal clerkships in the United States. Um, Gary Bourne, Donald Donovan, my own colleague, Luke Sabota have, have all clerked, I think, for the Supreme Court. Um, and, and certainly um, others as well. Uh, and, and so, you know, it's, it's not to suggest, especially to those JD listeners on the call, um, that, that it isn't uh, an effective path forward in international arbitration. But I think you'll just want to be mindful about how, how you're going to frame that um, if, if asked, you know, how will it lend value to your practice um, that you're able to explain that. Um, but it, you know, it, it is something that I think, uh, for those of you interested in it, you shouldn't shy away from exploring it, but you should just understand that in the arbitration space, um, there may be a little bit more interest in better understanding the rationale uh, than in litigation or even in transactional practices in the United States, where there's going to be, I think, a clear pathway established over time for those. I think in terms of timing, to Ankh's point, we tend to see colleagues who are doing the clerkship directly after law school. It's it's unusual in our experience to see them coming into practice, then pivoting to a clerkship and then back into practice. But that, that definitely does happen as well. I'll keep this brief because, again, I agree with pretty much everything the prior two speakers have said. Look at the firm. I get emails telling me, you know, we love ICJ, want to do ICJ work. Awesome. We don't do ICJ work. What do you want me to do about that? There are five firms that actively do ICJ work and even actively I'm using in quotes for the five firms. You know, if your interest is international law, a more, I think, thoughtful way to do it is to couch it in firms that do ISDS work that you do ISDS work, there's a public international law component. I find that interesting. Add value that way. So just look at the firm. For clerkship also, just echoing what you said, look at the firm and see what the past practice has been. If you see people have done clerkships 
often you can figure this out. Websites will tell you when the clerkship was done. I know our firm does that. If you see people doing it in the course of their career, after they have started, that may be an option. That may be something you want to explore. If you don't see that happening, maybe this is not the right opportunity to be raising that. So just this is, again, one of those things. Research your firm. Invest the time. Questions that are bothering you. Questions that you have. Often you can get a good understanding. Look at the firm's websites. They are dynamite sources of information. It really bothers me when I get what I would consider to be really stupid questions, right? There's something you could have in five minutes, spent some time on the website and come to the answer. So really urge you, spend time, research the people in a non-creepy way, know what the firm does and go prepared. I'll stop here. Thank you all three of you for these tips. I think it was very helpful to know that um, one of the key skills that candidates should have is also just doing your background research before you reach out to someone. And with that, we want to go on to our next question, which is, what are some other ways that candidates can prepare for the interview? Do you have any practical tips? And in particular, how can candidates prepare for the more technical questions that they might receive in an interview? For example, talking about an international arbitration case that they found interesting or answering a question on substantive law. Um, perhaps Hugh, you want to go first on this one. Sure. Uh, so I, I've already touched a little bit on my views when it comes to uh, reviewing your previous legal work and, and having a handle on that and perhaps even kind of thought a little bit about the types of follow-up questions that you may receive uh, in response to a summary. So I won't I won't so much revisit that. I'll be interested to hear what Ankh and Kabir have to say. Um, but on, on the preparation more generally, I think one area that candidates sometimes underappreciate the value of is when they're given the opportunity to ask questions. Um, the, it, it may strike you as sort of being okay, I've, I've made it through the difficult part. This is the home stretch where I can kind of, um, you know, stride into the finish line. And, and that's not the case. Uh, this, this is, uh, it's a very important part of the interview. It, it tells uh, the interviewer um, about what kind of due diligence you've done, how thoughtful uh, you may have been in that. And, and echoing computer just now, if, if there is information that is, for example, already sort of readily accessible on the website and, and you're asking effectively a question that could have been gleaned from a few moments of due diligence, that's not going to start you off on, on the best possible footing. Whereas uh, if it appears that you've done some due diligence and, and you have thoughtful questions either about sort of what the firm is doing in a particular space based on recent activity that may be available at Global Arbitration Review or elsewhere, um, you're inquiring about, for example, the types of mentorship, training opportunities, expanding upon what information may be available on the website. Um, that That's the type of thing I think that will uh, not only be very useful to you in considering different firms and that you really should wait quite carefully, um, but it, it will also not unhelpfully signal to your interviewer um, that, that you've put the time in and that you're, you're taking the interview seriously, that you've invested time beforehand. Uh, and, and these are all, um, in my view, positive signals that, that you would wish to send as a candidate. Um, and, and you might be surprised at, at sort of how frequently it is that, that we'll have interviews in which candidates appear to have, have done that additional legwork and have prepared thoughtful questions for it. <clears throat> so um, how to prepare for an interview? I think we have touched on a, a lot already. You, you do need to prepare. Uh, read up on the person you're interviewing with and on the firm you're interviewing with. Um, you should prepare for technical questions in advance. The, the same always come up, right? What's an interesting legal issue you've dealt with in a class? Uh, what are the trends or um, what, what particular case did you find interesting? These questions come back time and again. So they really should not be a surprise for you. And your answer should be practiced and prepared. And so I guess that's my main, main contribution to this question. Prepare by speaking the answers to the questions in advance. 
Um, I, you know, oral advocacy is a big part of what we do. I rarely go in and say something out loud for the first time when I actually say it before my audience. I've usually said it before, and I have never said something before to myself and not improved upon it the second time. It's always better the second time that you do it, always. And so it's the same with an interview. The first time you're going to explain what you think is an interesting legal issue, you're going to have waiting periods, you're going to have us, you're going to want to redo it, and you're going to not be very happy with the delivery. So you should have done it. I mean, that's my advice. Do it, do it yourself, either by yourself or with a friend, if you're comfortable doing that. And you can give each other tips on what works. If you do it with a friend, that person can actually tell you what they thought came across well and where you were maybe a little long winded or had trouble giving a clear and concise explanation of the point that you were trying to uh, convey. So with all these recurring questions, I do think you should absolutely be prepped with a with an answer. Of course, you don't want to sound like you learned something by heart and now you're 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 reciting it. Uh, and every single time you actually give the answer, it should sound a little differently but it but it should be it should be prepared that's my my main tip for this you know angst stole my thunder because i was literally going to say that practice practice in front of a mirror practice with your friend you know the muscle memory of talking talking persuasively you need to get familiar with that so do it. You know, some a lot of your questions is talking about yourself. And that is something which for most cultures, I would say probably this is uniquely American. So in pretty much every other country, that's uncomfortable. Practice that. Uh, eye contact, important. Eye contact, also important on Zoom. It's sometimes harder on Zoom. So just practice that. Uh, Another just related point, if you were asked a technical question and you don't know the answer, don't make up stuff. If you just, people will appreciate, you are not humans, you may not know everything. Try to pivot in an intelligent manner to something that you can talk about, but don't Lying, giving non-credible answers as though you know it, overselling, those are very apparent to your interviewer and those never come across well. So just say, trust yourself, you are already going in with the, with the, you know, with a good background, with a good preparation, you are all from good schools. Trust yourself, be positive. These are just some finer points to help you. Thanks very much all for for this very thoughtful answer. Uh, switching now to maybe the, the last section a bit more general and, and beyond the interview. Do you have any advice on how best to build a profile for a career in international arbitration? I mean, today there are a lot of opportunities between mentorships, uh, writing competitions, uh, various other projects. Uh, what what in your opinion are are good ways or good good project to engage in to to distinguish uh, from 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 other candidates or to build a, a profile and and maybe uh, ank you can go you can go first if that's fine sure i'm happy to um do excellent work every time everything you do do the best you can you make an impression with every single thing that you do. Uh, never underestimate something. Um, just because building a career, you build it block by block, step by step. It's a long-term process. It's a process that lasts your entire career, actually. Um, and so showing that you are a, a serious, um, thoughtful professional in everything that you do, uh, I think is very important. Um, find a mentor, find a sponsor. Um, I think that depends a lot on, on which type of organization you join. Uh, when you join a, a law firm like mine, 
Uh, there are many opportunities to find a, a mentor or sponsor within the firm, and that's very important to do uh, when you're at maybe a smaller organization um, and, and it's more difficult to find somebody in-house. There's plenty of opportunities to get outside sponsors and mentors. And even if you are in a firm like mine, or mine it's, it's, it's a good thing to do also. Uh, Young ICA has a sponsorship uh, program, for instance, or a mentorship program uh, that I know I didn't participate in myself yet, but I know several people who did. And, and I've heard very positive experiences from both sides of the of the relationship. I think it's a very valuable program, both for the mentees, but also for the mentors. Um, we all need mentors and sponsors uh, throughout our career again. Um, and, and, and so I think that's really important to find somebody that you can, that, that you can benefit from, but that you can give value to. And of course, that's the truth about all these relationships. They are really a two way street street, the sponsor, uh, or the mentor also gets things out of the relationship and, and understanding that and, and, and creating value in, a, in, in, in a two way street, I think is important. Uh, try to get active in an international arbitration organization. There's many, um, and there's there's many where there are opportunities. It's a crowded field, but you can uh, make a difference. And so find the one where you see an opportunity. You can do something uh, in the beginning. Say yes to to a lot of things and try to take on things so that you can prove um, yourself. I think a lot of them uh, provide opportunities for editing, for instance. Those types of jobs, which actually are hard work, um, take those jobs and do the hard work, and it'll pay. It'll pay. It'll pay benefits for the rest of your um, career. And then I would say, be both strate be strategic. So you know, plan your career. Try to identify what you think you need to do and go for it. On the other hand, also keep an eye out for opportunities and grasp those. A lot of the things that I've done over time where, you know, I'll have a strategic goal that didn't quite work out, but something else came my way and I grabbed that and it ends up being, giving me basically the same as what I was originally looking for. It just came to me in a different way. And I was, if I was too unflexible and focused on what I had set out, I would not have taken that and missed up, missed out on a lot of opportunities, I think. I uh, genuinely have little to add uh, to, to that very helpful advice. Uh, I suppose one one small point uh, for those of you who are quite junior who will be pivoting uh, into private practice, for example, um, for the first time next year or at least uh, or early in your careers. Um, in my view, and others may take a different one, the most important part of building a profile will be internal. It'll be a function of the work that you're doing at your firm. Uh, and I touched earlier on writing ability, and I, I just can't emphasize this enough, becoming a better writer uh, and, and cultivating that, taking every available opportunity to improve upon it, and, and there will be many, um, that, that will be critical. And, and I've seen sometimes in juniors um, that they look around and they feel that they're getting lapped out there, that there are people of, of their seniority uh, who are already speaking on panels, who are publishing articles, uh, and it, it strikes them as signaling that, that they need to be doing much more in the community. And there will be a time for that. Uh, the, the most important thing early on, though, is for you to focus on building up a reputation with the colleagues at your firm, that you are reliable, uh, that, that you work hard, are a good colleague, uh, and, and do good work. Uh, and with time, as, as you cultivate that internal reputation, uh, with a little bit of legwork, the external one will come. I, again, you know, this is a very agreeable panel. I have little to add. Your first two years in your career, you probably want to invest in building skills. So, you know, just really focus on becoming the expert in a case, somebody who knows the facts, somebody who knows 
everything about what you were doing if somebody calls you at 2 in the morning and tells you where is this what is this you have the answer right you touched upon this there's an internal profile and an external profile and both are important in your early stages learn the learn the skill learn how we make the statue build those third year you're technically entering into a mid level think about smaller pieces clover good starting place if you haven't done it partner with somebody join one or two organizations strategically but be active with them don't do what i did join seven and did nothing you rather join two bodies but do something try to take leadership positions volunteer so think of your career more as a marathon right so you have short term goals long term goals this is where i would like to be but your first few first two years just really learn understand the form understand the form structure understand the case understand how to write understand how the form likes you to write that's often even more challenging because different people have different preferences so learn that once you have mastered that then think about incrementally building your profile so that's what i would suggest echoing what the two prior awesome speakers said fantastic i i feel like i learn a lot more just hearing all your professional views on how young juniors can develop and so being conscious of time we just want to wrap up with one final question bringing it back to the student perspective what are your opinions on what courses that students right now looking towards a career later on should consider taking in school and more generally do you have any more parting advice for llm students in particular who are looking towards um, perhaps building a career in the us specifically um perhaps anki wants to start this off sure thanks andrea um on the classes yes uh i think this is a critical um question um i i students often think that they should fill their if they want to have a career in arbitration they should fill their uh list of classes with arbitration classes that's not the case that's the most important message that i want to convey on this board and probably on the panel in general of course you need to take an arbitration class uh because this is a field you want to practice in so you need to learn it and you you need to show that you have an interest in it but this field requires a lot more than knowledge of arbitration law and and so you should not just have arbitration classes when you are uh, an llm take a contracts class it is so important a lot of the arbitration work that we do is comes our way in new york because we uh, new york law governs and it's really a new york law question and and so contracts is and and it's typically a contract question so contracts law is an absolutely basic fundamental class i would be very hesitant to take on uh, an llm who has not taken contracts because i would feel they're missing a basic basic class um that's the key class i think other than that uh, again as i uh, as i've said before it's ultimately about economic recovery so any kind of economics class is of interest anything that will help you with understanding damages accounting uh, some type of economics class i think is very helpful uh, and then uh, there are still several firms in the city we're not one of them but there there's still several firms where people do arbitration but they also do litigation and of course by the way you can do that at our firm too but we do have associates who do mainly of only arbitration but there are several firms where you are expected to do both and so to you must then take a civil procedure class and evidence those two classes are very very important and even at a firm like myself i took took those two classes and i think they've always been extremely helpful for me in my career to understand the us 
legal framework from a procedural angle. Of course, even if you do arbitration work, very often uh, there's enforcement actions or collateral action in the U.S. courts. And maybe if maybe your litigation colleague might do the actual oral argument before the judge, you, you will be involved in the brief and you need to understand the U.S. Uh, concepts. So um, I think those, so a contracts class, um, an economics class, and, and CIFPRO and evidence for me are, are key classes. Kabir, I just go ahead. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Right sorry, just parting wisdom, two words. Um, good luck. Um, it takes grit. Uh, to also find a job in this field, but you need it for the job too. So if this is what you want, um, you know, be smart about it, persist. You'll, you'll probably get some rejection along the way. Um, I, I got more rejection letters than I sent letters in the beginning. So, and I ended up where I am. So, um, you know, persist, don't take it personally. Um, this is all about the right person at the right time. Um, and it's not about any lack of skills or qualities if, if, if things are a little tough and, and be flexible and creative. And thank you again. Um, I see that we're, we're already north of the hour. Um, so I, I'll simply echo Ankh tacking on um, should time permit. And I know that many LLMs are sort of uh, limited by New York bar requirements as to how many non-US courses they may take. but legal writing should the opportunity present itself further to what we were talking about before. And I think that public speaking is something that can be very useful to careers over time. And if you don't have experience in that, that can be, law school can be a great opportunity to secure that. Um, but more than anything, as Ong said, good luck. Yeah, I'm not gonna repeat anything, just wishing you all very good luck. This is a stressful time. Take care of your mental health. Do some deep breathing. Go for walks when it's not minus 10 outside. Do things to, you know, you want to be fresh and prepared, but you don't want it to, you don't want to get so anxious or apprehensive that you are negative and feel dejected when it is a stressful time. Just acknowledge that. So, so try to find ways to relax and take good care. Be awesome. You will all do great. So, never lose perspective of that. Thank you, all three of you, for the really good final parting words that I hope everyone really takes to heart. Um, indeed, this is not an easy field to succeed in, and it really takes, well, grit, perseverance, and just a lot of research and perfect timing. Um, with that, we want to thank everyone who has tuned in today and thank anyone who watches this recording in the future who wasn't able to join us live today. And we also want to extend our three our thanks to our three speakers and um, Simon, my co-panelists for all the amazing questions that you've managed to field today as well. Um, thank you once again. And we also trust that these three speakers remain open to any more cold emails or questions that we didn't manage to ask on behalf of anyone watching this today. So thank you once again for your time. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.